Khan. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Human Rights Campaign. And in my role, I get to work with our Parents for Transgender Equality Council. I get to support programs like Welcoming Schools and our Youth Wellbeing Program. I'm really happy to work on behalf of LGBTQ youth and in particular, promoting well-being for trans, gender non-binary and gender expansive youth. Today, we're gonna to be talking about trans youth and extracurricular activities. And I'm joined by three amazing people, Aiden, Sam, and Al. I'm gonna have them each introduce themselves, starting with Aiden. Good morning, my name is Aiden Olson Kennedy. I use he, him, his pronouns. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and the executive director of the Los Angeles Gender Center, which is a nonprofit organization providing identity affirming mental health care to children, adolescents, families, and adults. I'm also a transgender myself, having transitioned 13 years ago. Hi everyone, my name is Sam Oleg. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am 20 years old, I am a sophomore in college, and I am a youth ambassador for the Human Rights Campaign. Good morning, my name is Al Johnson. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am the education facilitator and a support group facilitator with Trans Family Support Services. We are a San Diego-based nonprofit that serves the transgender community with a focus on making a safe and affirming world for transgender youth everywhere. Um, I'm also a bachelor's in social work student at SDSU and uh, a trans youth myself, so. Great, well, let's start this conversation by laying out a couple of things we know are true. We know that um, from, we know from a lot of research um, with young trans people that they are often uh, fearful of being out or being outed um, at school as well as in other areas of daily life that would include extracurricular activities like being on a sports team, um, being in the performing arts or creative arts, being in uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts or other kinds of scouting activities and so many other things that fall into this umbrella of extracurricular activities. We also know that these kinds of extracurricular activities can really be beneficial, both for physical health, mental health, and developing strong social uh, relationships with peers. So we wanna talk about what, what we can do to create more opportunities for trans youth to be engaged in and benefit from extracurricular activities should they have the interest and desire to do so. So I'll, po I'll pose a first question and we'll give each of you a chance to answer um, this question and others as we go through this conversation. So we, as I said, we think that trans youth might be, and I say trans to be inclusive of non-binary, gender expansive, um, trans youth may be missing out on some of these opportunities to build skills, to develop friendships, to build a resume that might help them in a future career. Um, so what do you think, um, can you speak to some of those concrete positive outcomes you have seen either from your own experience or experience of the folks you work with that really show that connection between extracurricular activities and positive health outcomes? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll jump right in on that one. So speaking for myself and my own experience, um, I did a handful of extracurriculars when I was in high school, but the most important to me was I, I played water polo all four years. Um, and water polo is one of those sports where it's very clear based on the uniform what gender you're playing with. Um, but what came from me more than the gender dysphoria of, you know, being on a women's team and, and all those sorts of uh, binary associated pieces was um, I had struggled with an eating. I was about 13 years old because of some of my dysphoria, um, pieces like I didn't want to menstruate. I didn't want to have breast growth. And so I had stopped eating. And for me, water polo became this wake up call of, oh, you can't get away with this anymore because you love this sport and you love this team. Um, and in order to do it to your best capacity, you have to eat. And so for me, it actually it had a really huge impact on my health physically and mentally because I realized um, I have to eat in order to keep doing this thing that I love. And so I, you know, I tell folks all the time, especially the, the girls that I played polo with, um, that it, it genuinely saved my life because I don't know if I would have ever gotten out of that um, had I not started playing a sport. 
And I also got really lucky that the majority of my team was other LGBTQ folks. I built a lot of really lasting relationships. And um, my best friend and I, we both came out as trans around the same time playing water polo together. And so it definitely helped with with some of the awkwardness around gender identity for, for him and I to just kind of like look at each other and be like, ah, women's sports, right? Like, so that all definitely made water polo for me a really positive experience. And I ended up following it throughout college. Um, and actually once I stopped playing, I, I struggled a little bit more with my dysphoria just because I no longer had this reason to, um, to enjoy my body the way that my body is. So for me, water polo specifically, sports specifically, was uh, a huge piece to my my physical health in regards to like keeping me from from starving myself. Thanks for sharing that, Al. Sam, do you want to respond? Sure. Let's see. One of the probably most positive experiences that I had personally was I started taekwondo, which is a, a South Korean martial art. I started it when I was about six years old. And when you're, before you become a black belt, they call you by your first name. But when you reach the level of black belt, they call you miss or mister. And then whatever your last name is. And I was there four to five days a week, loving every single second of it. And suddenly I hit black belt and I told my mom, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to quit. And she was like, what? Why? because I was being called Miss Molig. And that was just, the dysphoria was too, too much for me in that role. And when I transitioned, we went back to the martial arts school and said, Sam's transgender, you know, use male pronouns. Sam goes by Sam. And the entire staff was completely uneducated. And within 24 hours, I came back into the school and they continued to affirm my identity. And I remember the first time they ever used male pronouns and they called me Mr. Molig. And I, I will never forget that moment because it just like, it's like a little light just turned on inside of me. And I felt like I was being seen from behind the curtain after so long of not being seen. So that was definitely one of my most positive experiences with an extracurricular activity was I was affirmed and I knew I was protected in this place. That's terrific. Glad that was positive. I know it can go either way sometimes. Aiden, what do you see among your clients and certainly anything from your personal experience you'd like to share about positive potential here? Sure. So one of the things that is often pervasive for trans and non-binary youth is um, isolation isolation and loneliness. And what we know about team sports uh, or even sports where you're sort of competing individually, but you're part of a larger team is that it allows people to feel connected to something bigger and greater than themselves and their immediate family. And, And so team sports or sort of extracurricular activities or performance whatever it is that allows that person to feel connected to something is a significant protective factor for trans and non-binary youth well-being and overall mental health. I think that there is um, often stress in the decision-making process for trans and non-binary youth who have the opportunity to be non-disclosed to figure out how to participate in a meaningful way. Um, And obviously there are some extracurricular activities, as Al mentioned, that will sort of inherently out you just by participating in that particular sport. But um, there is, you know, there's an interesting exchange of anxiety. So for some youth participating, um, while it creates connections that are really meaningful, it also creates a secondary anxiety that somebody may discover that they're trans or not binary. And so young people such as, you know, Sam's example, will love something, but then disengage um, because gender dysphoria you know, people who are trans or non-binary and have any level of distress at all are sort of in this chronic state of accommodating and adjusting to dysphoria as opposed to accommodating and adjusting to maybe what they actually want. That's a really important point. And it kind of leads me to a follow-up question, which is there are legitimate reasons that trans folks would be fearful about stepping into some new space to be on a team or to attend a dance class or to sign up for uh, scouting or whatever the case might be, whatever their interests are, because they may know from experience, say, at school, that it hasn't been safe to be an out trans or non-binary person, um, or that if they are outed, it may not go well. So 
knowing that that is a legitimate concern, um, to your point, Aiden, what, uh, and all of you can respond to this based on your experience and your knowledge, what are some of the things we can do, maybe lessons we can draw from advocacy we've done at school or what we've learned about um, navigating spaces uh, to, to try to create more um, sort of a more welcoming, inclusive space in these extracurricular um, environments? I think that, um, I mean, obviously always education is, is a piece of it, but I think, um, again, sort of Sam's story really rings true for me around this is that sometimes education or advocacy is provided in these environments as a result of a trans or non-binary student. And so it's often reactive education. And I think reactive education, while it can be effective for sure, um, it tends to center around a particular person or around a particular student. And that doesn't necessarily change the culture of, of the environment. And certainly it's helpful for, for future trans or non-binary people coming in. But I think that there <clears throat> is, a, is a real value to going in and, and sort of understanding the environments that trans and non-binary youth are in and being proactive and creating conversations and having advocacy and education happen. And, you know, we're obviously always up against a larger um, struggle around the environment that at, at large that has a lot of um, inappropriate narratives about trans and non-binary folks competing, right? And, and, and so I think that trickles down to younger generations um, and then the school environments that they're in. Yeah, that's, I mean, we know there's a lot of controversy right now being created by folks who don't want trans kids to fully participate in sports. And hopefully we're going to get ahead of that and, and be successful, uh, at least, you know, in terms of legislation and policy. Al, I wondered if I could ask you a follow-up here that, um, you know, for, for binary trans folks, um, maybe they, you know, whether they're stealth or out, um, some of these very gendered activities, like there's a boys team, there's a girls team. Um, there's a certain pathway for binary trans folks to participate, not saying it's easy. Um, for non-binary folks, however, there's another layer of um, considerations. Um, so I'm wondering, based on your experience, but also drawing from the, the knowledge you all have working with non-binary folks, what are some of the maybe recommended best practices for navigating some of these gendered spaces? That is a really good question. Um, <clears throat> for myself and my own experience, I wasn't out at home when I was in high school. And so I didn't affirm my own gender a lot of the time. So I did kind of just default to assigned sex at birth and not really assert anything around my, my own identity. Um, but what we've seen time and time again is that folks on the non-binary um, like continuum spectrum, however you want to refer to it, folks who identify similarly to myself, um, we want desperately to participate, right? And it becomes very awkward of balancing those pieces of, like, I loved my team. I loved the girls that I played polo with. Like I said, I met my best friend through polo. Um, but at the same time, it was very difficult to put myself in a women's space. But at the same time, I could never see myself in a men's space uh, for safety reasons and, and also just very obvious purposes of secondary sex characteristics. Um, and so... So sports, it becomes a very difficult conversation for non-binary folks, especially in the world of like swim and dive, um, just because of how uniforms are, you have to really make a decision there. Uh, and, and so I very much believe that, you know, we follow the lead of, of the person who's saying, well, I, I want to do this. And so whatever that is, we make those accommodations. Um, there really has to be creative new language around it. It's, it's really difficult because I think inherently we do have to divide things like like uh, national wide organizations, things like sports, they have to be divided in these ma male, female categories, just because not everyone's on the up and up. And I think eventually maybe we might get to this place where better language is developed. Um, but also in areas like, you know, I also did theater and choir all throughout uh, high school and um there, I really did see some creativity with with how do you audition for your sections, and well, it's not just girls who are in women's ensemble. You know, women's ensemble became much more diverse than that, and it's not just women who are altos and sopranos or men who are bass and tenors. Um, and so, 
there was kind of this progression of, of creative language. And I think the language piece is the largest piece to affirming non-binary identities um, because so often it feels like language excludes us. Uh, and so, you know, specifically when navigating extracurriculars with trans, with non-binary folks, um, you have to be very intentional in the words that you use and it's tricky. And I even catch myself defaulting all the time. I say, Oh, the girls I played water polo with, there was a boy on my team and I wasn't a girl. And so we really have to be catching ourselves and, and constantly challenging our own ideas of what it means to be um, divided up in these particular categories. So, yeah. Thanks for that. I just, I think it's important to, make clear that there are different considerations depending on how young young people are identifying. Aiden, do you want to add anything to that before we move on to another question? No, I, I think that I'll did a fantastic job. Okay, terrific. Well, let me start with you on this next question, Aiden, and then we'll move back to Sam. So some, I mean, you work, you work with individuals and families, I'm sure, in your practice. And um, I imagine that some parents and caregivers are trying to navigate this space with their with their kids and maybe depending on where the kids are in their journey and how much experience they've had with extracurriculars and whether they're faring well or not at school, the parents might be a little worried about um, sort of encouraging or helping to facilitate access to, again, sports or after school programs or whatever the case might be. Maybe fearful that their child won't be safe or won't be ready for some of the interaction. Um, can you speak to that and like maybe some some words of consideration, not advice because you know there's a lot of variation, but just some considerations for parents when they want to help their child navigate those spaces and have access to those spaces? Sure. So you know, I can recall a variety of different scenarios of, over the course of my career. Um, where, where young people in a variety of age, ages really wanted to engage in, in sports or extra, extracurricular activities, whether that's performance. And uh, I recall a very young trans girl who um, really, really wanted to do ballet. And uh, there are uh, obviously, there, there could be issues with the, the costume um, of, of trans kids doing ballet. And, um, you know, the mom was working really, really hard to figure out how to work around it and what to do and accommodations. And she was going to a whole host of people, but this young person was non-disclosed. And so mom was trying to navigate these conversations um, using terms like privacy. Um, and my kid feels insecure and my kid feels shy, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, I think that parents are working really, really hard navigating um, sometimes their own fear about, not just physical safety, but emotional safety um, and the desires of their kid. Uh, and, and I think it's very challenging, particularly if your, your young person is non-disclosed. Um, I've also had clients who actually came to realize or recognize their gender through theater. Um, I have a, a person who um, was given the opportunity to play a role that is different than their designated sex mm -hmm. at birth. And through that experience realized, oh my gosh, I'm actually trans. And it was just really transformative experience. But what I have found with, with parents specifically and, and, and work really, really hard is um, reminding parents that, that neither their children nor them owe anything to anyone. That we don't owe outing our children. We don't own outing ourselves as trans, as parents of trans and non-binary kids. And, and that is often the biggest struggle because there is still this larger message that if you're not out, you're lying or you're being deceiving, or you're withholding information. Um, and and I and for me, I don't really believe that. That's not a belief system that I support. And I don't think it helps with the psychological, emotional, or physical safety of young people wanting to engage in, um, in, in sports or arts or anything that is creative, anything that's outside the house, because many young people will choose simply to not participate if they're unable to be non-disclosed. So a lot of the work with parents is, is fear storytelling and, and fear and trying to suss out what's an actual threat and what feels like an emotional threat to them. I really appreciate that you made that point. I mean, you know, it could be a different situation for a young person who has been, say, part of a sports team for years and is going to transition and stay part of that team or a child who's known in the drama class or the ballet class or on the, you know, in the Boy Scout troop and, and then is going to start transitioning 
that, you know, that presents a whole different set of conversations that a parent or caregiver might need to have and review, review of policies and education. So I appreciate you clarifying that, it, you know, there, you know, sometimes a trans identity is the factor and other times it maybe doesn't have to be. Um, Sam, I want to turn to you. Um, I happen to know about your career in gymnastics um, since we know each other. And I know um, just like some parents might be a little cautious about supporting their kids in these activities, worried about their safety or well-being. Um, sometimes trans young people, binary young people themselves are maybe really would love to take a taekwondo or join a, a, a team or do something after school, um, but just are are worried that they won't fit in or won't be accepted. And therefore the potential benefits of that program just aren't, can unfold. Uh, knowing that it's not always rosy, I wondered if you could share from your own experience, um, you know, how, you know, or, or sort of share with young people who might be a little timid about stepping into that space, what you've learned from that experience and how you've navigated some challenges. Definitely. Um, well, when it comes to navigating challenges, um, when it came to, at least when I was younger and I didn't quite have the words to educate people on my own, um, I had a lot of help from friends and family. Um, for example, when I played basketball, um, there was a lot of uncertainty with my parents of if I was going to be affirmed, um, because I was still in elementary school and teams were mixed and it was boys and girls, but there was still a fear of, was I going to be recognized as a male? And in that circumstance, um, my mother, bless her, um, went up to the manager who ran the entire program and said, listen, my kid is transgender. This is what it means. Do we have your support? that he will be acknowledged as male and he will be respected and that I was going to be safe. And going from the top and that trickled down and that way I was able to be in a space with other um, kids and not have to out myself or to explain anything to anyone. I know when we did, uh, HRC um, did a national uh, survey of LGBTQ teens a couple years back, and we asked about participation in after school activities, extracurricular activities, and then compared that to, um, you know, cisgender and non, uh, cisgender and heterosexual youth of the same age. And we were, you know, our community was much less likely to participate. And it was really about these concerns of, will I be accepted? Will I be treated well? And if for young people who are not having such a great experience at school, I think the expectation is, well, I'll go into this after school program, I'll join this team, I'll join this club. And then bam, you know, it's the same, you know, bad treatment again. So for, as we close out the conversation, um, I'll ask, you know, all three of you to speak to you know, that's sort of the main point you'd want to make maybe if you're talking to a young person who is interested in something and who you think might actually benefit from the, you know, the the um, benefit health-wise emotionally from, from some kind of activities. Just what are some of the things you would want to leave that person with to think about? We could start with um, Al. Sure. Um, it's funny, Aiden actually brought up, you know, some folks made or how how one client in particular I think you said uh kind of figured out that they were trans through doing theater and, and that was actually my experience as well I was um I was lucky enough to be cast in a in a production where I was a male role but a female ensemble member uh for a musical because they needed those um voices in in the ensemble and so that opportunity to switch kind of genders in between scenes and, and this idea that no one in the audience knew that that was my wake-up call um and it helped me realize like, this is what euphoria feels like. So, I mean, what I would say is if you, if you feel like you're unable to participate because you're scared of what's gonna happen if they find out, a lot of the times in my own experience, and, and I get it, I grew up in a very conservative area within San Diego. Um, it's really not 
always the greatest place to be. But my experience with my teammates, my experience with my cast members, with the other folks in my choir was always more positive than I had worked myself up to believe. Um, there were always folks, you know, who wanted to disregard my gender, who would make me explain myself, especially with, with this piece of being non-binary. But so often I developed these really fast and secure friendships. And once I did disclose, a lot of the times I was so affirmed by my peers. It's a different conversation with coaches and directors, and, and that's always going to be a tricky piece to navigate. But some of the folks you're going to meet doing these activities um, I, those friendships are going to transcend you participating in that activity. And, and like I said in the beginning, I, it genuinely saved my life to be a part of a team and, and to have folks um, see me for who I was and to have a reason to keep my body somewhat healthy. So uh, my piece would, would just be, do it. I, you're missing out by not doing it. If you have any sort of inkling that you might enjoy something, if it all goes south, you know, you can leave. But um, a lot of the times, especially for our young folks, you're going to find your peers are so much more understanding and may identify similarly. So that's that's what I would like to leave on for me. <laughs> I love that. Thanks, Al. Sam, do you want to um, share some of your, your final thoughts and then we'll go to Aiden? Um, sure, Ellen. Um, even if I was speaking to a youth, to a parent, I would still say follow the lead of your child and, you know, finding outlets and resources. So if you are apprehensive to join a sports team or choir or anything like that, it's having resources, like having trans family support services, having PFLAG, finding support groups and having those side connections to other people who are like you sort of as like a safety blanket just so maybe when you're walking into this, whatever experience it is, you feel less alone and you know that you're not the first one doing this and you have people there who are going to support you through it. I love that. I'll just note just quickly, depending on where you live, you might have something like we have in the D.C. area, which is a trans youth choir. So, you know, talk about stepping into a safe space as an alternative to maybe the school choir. So in some places, those kinds of things exist. Aiden? Yeah, I just want <clears throat> to, excuse me, add that, that in some ways we're having multiple conversations around a singular topic because when you're younger and you're given the opportunity to transition, go on blockers and cross sex hormones early, the, your ability to access these spaces are very, very different, <clears throat> excuse me, than, than somebody who maybe wasn't able to access early intervention and, and, and is not given the opportunity to be non-disclosed or there's particular advantages or disadvantages depending upon the hormones that you have in your, your body, right? And, and so from choir, if your voice has already dropped or you know if your voice has not yet dropped, um, but also there is a geographic component. I was raised in, in rural Southern Oregon <clears throat> and I was um, an athlete and, and not unlike Al, it absolutely saved my life, although um, it, it, I didn't know much about my gender at the time and didn't disclose that I was trans until much, much later. But I think that understanding the nuances of the circumstance that your young person or that you yourself find yourself in as a parent or a caregiver, a young person, and, and then um, getting some assistance. And, and again, you know, whether that is um, family and parent advocacy, um, mental health advocacy, whatever it is. Um, but there, there are times and circumstances in which as trans and non-binary people, um, we don't get to do the things that we would like to do. Um, and figuring out ways that if that is the case of the circumstance for your young person, um, how do you support that person? How do you support yourself? As parents, it's very challenging when we know that our young person can't do something they really want to do. It's very painful for us. Um, and then maybe come up and create potential alternatives um, that is, it, it may take a little bit more work and it may take more resources, um, that there doesn't have to be one outcome or one solution for it ultimately to be a successful experience. Thanks so much. It's a really terrific way to summarize the conversation and it's a, it's a hopeful message and a really wise message. So I'll take this moment to thank all three of you for sharing from your personal experience, your professional experience, for sharing so openly and thoughtfully and we hope that this has been helpful for the audience. And thanks again for tuning in today. <laughs>